So friends, here we stand at the start of a new church year. And in the name of starting this new church year in the right way, with a clean slate, with our, our hearts and minds fixed firmly on what can be, unburdened by what has been, uh, I feel the need today to begin with a, a bit of a confession. Uh, there's something I kind of want to get ahead of before it comes out to public to kind of control the narrative a little bit, lest it becomes a source of embarrassment or disrepute for the members of this congregation. Uh, and so here it is. Uh, it appears that uh, over the past four decades of my life or so, I have apparently been on the record fairly consistently making the observation, and depending on how you look at it, it's either the very brave observation or the very rude observation, uh, but I've been on the record making the, the observation that newborn babies, not cute at all. In fact, I may, I may, I might, it is not confirmed, but I may have went so far as to say that with their little wrinkly meatball-looking faces, with their, their eyes crossed because they can't properly focus in on anything yet, and oftentimes with their old man bald-looking heads, I, I may, ju just may have said that they're, they're actually kind of funny-looking. In any case, it just feels good to, to get that off my chest at, at last. Thank you for, for receiving that confession. Uh, but as you might be able to uh, imagine, taking a, a provocative and forward-thinking stance such as that, it is a bit of a professional liability for a pastor. And through the years, I've had to navigate some pretty dicey terrain in that regard because churches are veritable magnets for newborn babies. And time and again through the years, people have walked through those doors, clutching, proudly clutching their newborn babies in their arms, and they bring it up to me and say, they say, Pastor, oh my God, is this not the most beautiful thing that you have, the most precious thing that you have ever seen in your entire life? And that's a hard position to be in. <laughs> On the one hand, right, Jesus tells us not to lie. On the other hand, I really like my job. So here's what I've taken to saying, and you can use this line if it helps you out of a similar sticky situation. What I like to say is I respond by saying, my God, they look just like you. <laughs> and if you know anything about gushing parents, you will know that this causes them to gush all the more. It's true, they'll say, they have my nose, they have my eyes, my ears. In the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, that was not the compliment that you think it is. And likewise, you have no doubt heard the quintessential story about how a baby received their name. We were going to name her Pam, they say, but then we saw her face and we knew she was a Kelly. We were going to name him Dwight, but then we laid eyes on him and we knew he looked more like a Michael. And whenever I'm told one of the, these name stories, consummate professional that I am, I nod and I smile and say, what a lovely choice of names. But again, Satan's working in the back of my mind, and I'm thinking to myself, unless you name that beatball-looking thing Bolognese, I assure you that child does not look like one name over and above any other. In a spirit of confession, it's good to have this off my chest. Oh, friends, oh, friends, but then, but then, a year and a half ago yesterday, I was sitting at my dining room table. My wife was in our back office leading a Zoom group for work, and we got a call from a social worker in Florida who said, if you can get down here in 48 hours, there's a little baby boy about to be born who will be yours to adopt. So we had two suitcases. We threw a truly random assortment th thing, things in that, and, and we headed out. On the way down, I called Reverend Wendy. He said, I'm probably not going to be in church on Sunday. I'm headed down to Florida. But we hopped in that car, and a day and a half later, we arrived in a NICU in Jacksonville, Florida, and we walked in, and we saw this little baby boy for the very first time this little baby boy with his wrinkly, meatball-looking face. 
this, this little boy with eyes crossed because he couldn't yet properly focus on anything yet. This little boy with this old man looking bald hair. And oh my God, have you ever seen anything so precious in your entire life? And I know we're not biologically related, but we kind of look like each other, don't we? <laughs> don't we? It's true. And on, the, on that 1,500-mile drive down to, to Florida, we came up with a list of three possible names. That little boy was either going to be named Alexander James, Jeremiah James, or Findlay James. And let me tell you, we get in the room, he did not look like an Alexander. No, he did not. He did not look like a, a Jeremiah. But when we saw that little face, we knew he looked like a Finn. And so Findlay James, it was. Bolognese wasn't even on the list. <laughs> so friends, it turns out, it turns out that there is a very big difference. There is a world of difference between a child and my child, a very big difference because with a child, there is objectivity there. There is emotional remove there where you can stand back and take bold and provocative stances and, and, and say or at least think snarky comments in your head when people show you their babies. But let me tell you, when it is my child, when it is my child, there is no objectivity there whatsoever. There is no emotional remove there. To me, my child is infinitely precious. My child is boundlessly adored, endlessly treasured, immeasurably, immeasurably loved. When it's not a child, but when it is my child, it turns out. So why do I share this confession with you this morning? Simply to, to out myself to you as a huge hypocrite? <laughs> I suppose that is a lesson you could probably draw from this story, but I will invite you to look away for this morning. Uh, but also, and more importantly, I, I share this story with you because in our reading this morning from chapter 3 of the Gospel of Matthew, we have this story in which Jesus is baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River. And as Jesus is coming out of those waters after being baptized, the heavens open, the Holy Spirit descends down from above as a dove, and we hear the voice of God declare about Jesus, but also we believe through Jesus about all of humanity, about each and every human being, we hear God declare, this is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. Now, when this story usually gets talked about, a lot of attention is usually paid to that phrase, beloved child. And that is for good reason. It just kind of sounds nice, does it? Beloved, I'm a beloved child of God. That phrase has a lot of good juju in it, I think. But what's more, this phrase teaches us two important things. First, the use of the word child tells us how God relates to humanity. Namely, that, that God relates to us as a parent unto a child. It is a relationship of care, nurture, and support as we grow and mature in our faith, in life, and really in everything. And then second, the use of the word beloved tells us something about the nature of that parent-child relationship. It's not a harsh or abusive relationship full of rebuke, full of dysfunction, full of harm. Instead, it's a parent-child relationship defined primarily by love. We are God's beloved, beloved children. And if you've been kicking around this community for any time at all, you know that we make a lot of hay about this phrase, beloved child. In fact, I dare you, I defy you to try to escape from one of our worship services without being told that you are a beloved child of God in one form or another. The only way you're getting out that door without hearing that is if you are very hard of hearing and very poor at reading lips. Because we want you to know that you are a beloved child of God because that is our mission, after all, loving God loving people, that is all that we do here 
at this church. But what I want to suggest to you this morning is that while that phrase, beloved child, is all well and good and nice, where the real power is in this verse, where the real juice is, it's in that little bitty teeny weeny two-letter word that directly precedes the phrase beloved child that tiny unassuming usually unremarked upon possessive pronoun my because you aren't just a beloved child says god you are my beloved child and as i can personally attest to you there is a very big difference between the two Because when God says that you are my child, God says you are mine, what that means is that there is no objectivity there whatsoever. There is no emotional remove there whatsoever. It means that to God, to God, you are infinitely precious. Do you get that? It means that that to God, you are boundlessly adored. To God, you are endlessly treasured. To God, you are immeasurably, immeasurably, irrationally, irrevocably loved. That's what it means when God claims you as my child. And here at the outset of this new church year, I cannot think of a better or more important message for our community. Because that love, that love that has no objectivity, that love that has no emotional remove from us whatsoever, that love is always our foundation and our starting point. Because absolutely everything that we do here throughout the year, worship, service, hanging out, what have you, it all starts there. So friends, this morning, may you hear these words. And better yet, friends, may you actually believe these words. And even better still, may you be comforted, may you be emboldened, may you be encouraged, and ultimately, may you be transformed by these words from God's lips to your ears. You are my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. Would all of God's children say amen? Amen. Amen.